Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, Kevin Rudd taps into the spirit of Julian Assange, Christopher Pine banned from using his favourite term, and Colonel Gaddafi's son warns of civil war in Libya. Our panel tonight, Miriam Lyons from the Centre for Policy Development, Annabelle Crabb from ABC Online, and in Melbourne, Chris Berg from the Institute of Public Affairs. The issues of immigration and multiculturalism were back on the national political agenda today. Labor was claiming the high moral ground as Parliament resumed. The Prime Minister used question time to warn Tony Abbott the coalition was risking a return to one nation style politics unless he replaced his immigration spokesman, Scott Morrison. We have proudly created a multicultural society with record levels of post war migration. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, I stand here as one example of that migration. And overwhelmingly across those years, that multiculturalism, that, that unity, that non discriminatory immigration policy has had bipartisan support. Mr. Speaker, it is the responsibility of elected officials to ensure the debate on immigration and multiculturalism is handled sensitively, maturely and, most importantly, honestly. It's incumbent on all political leaders to uphold the values of freedom of religion and respect, and any pandering to or encouragement of any prejudice in the community has no place in the Australian political discourse. Well, I don't think it was since 1996 that I've heard multiculturalism and one nation dominate question time like yeah, that. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I mean, we haven't been hearing a lot about multiculturalism uh, as of late because the, the Labor government kind of temporarily banished the term and has only just reinstated it. In fact, Kate Lundy uh, was in at Yarralumla just being sworn in as a multicultural spokesperson, um, which is the way her title has been amended um, after the announcement of Chris Bowen that multiculturalism was back and mm. it's always been a marvellous triumph and something of which Australia can be proud. So, um, And One Nation, uh, after many years of not being mentioned in Question Time, is somehow now this sort of significant player in the sense that it's being invoked by the government as the inspiration for Tony Abbott's thinking. Now, um, that of course bounces off the sort of um, wingdings we've had in recent weeks with um, Scott Morrison's um, reasonably extreme statements about uh, asylum seekers. Um, but it's kind of interesting that Julia Gillard should allege that One Nation is the group behind Tony Abbott's thinking, given that Tony Abbott spent a couple of years trying, trying to, to stamp them, that party into the ground. So mm. I imagine he'll be having a, a quiet little chuckle about that aspect of it. Yeah. Chris Berg, what do you think's behind uh, Labor's move to bring up multiculturalism again, particularly in question time today? Um, I think it's, it's quite obviously a response to what Scott Morrison has been saying. But I think more interesting is this uh, playing the One Nation card, which appears to be like playing the Nazi card um, in, a, in an online debate. It's such an extreme statement to say any party is a follower of One Nation, because as we all know, One Nation was not just, you know, a, a lower the Muslim immigration rate. There were a huge range of policies to do with, uh, you know, Aboriginals off the dole, all this sort of stuff that were very, very offensive about One Nation and to claim that the Liberal Party is taking its cues from One Nation is, 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 is I think, self-evidently absurd. But it just goes to show how far off the prairie this debate about multiculturalism has gotten in the last couple of weeks. Well, although this link, um, and I'm sure, you know, One Nation would be kind of mildly surprised and thrilled to have attained the status of a card that can be played. You know, that's it's, quite it's a, no sub it's that's no quite a substantial their, um, evolutionary yeah. milestone to be a card. <laughs> but um, it, it, this, this link actually harks back to the decision that the coalition made about cutting the aid to Indonesian schools. And this is where it first sort of came up because there had been this sort of one nation chain email that had gone around saying charity begins at home and why are we giving all this money to schools in Indonesia when there's schools in Australia that need money and so on. So I think that kind of was the causal link that, that started out. Yeah. yeah this whole thing. Uh, I, Mar I Miriam, how do you, why do you think yeah. Labor's doing this and, and could it pose certain dangers to them in, 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 in certain seats that they were desperately trying to win at the last election? Well, dangers that they might regrow a spine. I think it probably poses dangers to the architects of 
of Labor's strategy in the last election, um, given that you know they were the architects of Gillard actually making nods towards anti-immigration and anti-multicultural sentiment. So, you know, I think that they're the, probably the ones who ought to be worried at this point. Um, I, you know, it is a bit rich in some ways for Labor to be taking the moral high ground on this now, uh, just when it's become clear how unpopular uh, the attempts to cross the line, I guess, on this issue um, had been for the Liberal Party. So in some ways it's a bit uh, opportunistic, I guess, rather than Chris? you know speaking to a, a sort of long-term principled... Chris, is this Labor trying yeah. to show a spine, trying to show some conviction? Um, I would hope so because I'm a big supporter of multiculturalism, and I really wish that the Labor Party would 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 jump on board. But but I think I think this has all the hallmarks of uh, the Labor Party just flapping around, looking for um, uh, whether it wants to go right or left on, um, on on migrants, on asylum seekers. What I find particularly concerning about this entire debate is the way that both the coalition and the Labor Party have conflated a whole ton of issues together, so that it's one big statement about about. Foreigners. So they've tied together the concept of multiculturalism and asylum seekers and Muslim immigration. Everything just gets lumped together in, into one, one general feeling that something's not right. Which is, when these are all very specific policy areas that can and should be debated. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that that happened during the... That was one of the most dispiriting things, I reckon, about the federal election campaign last year, where you saw, um, you know, this sort of uh, clinch with each other, the major parties sort of huddled together together on the issue of sort of border protection and asylum seekers and so on. And then somehow... Um I got linked with congestion in Western Sydney. That's yeah. right. And it also got linked with just general migration. I mean, even skilled migration yeah. Yeah. sort of got you know, sucked into this vortex, mm. which had hitherto been like an area of bipartisan agreement that, that they were separate issues. But all of a sudden, you know, they became all fused together. And I wonder if maybe this, what's going on um, in the last week or two, is you see, you know, a move uh, in some parts of the coalition to a more extreme view being kind of... Um, uh, compensated for by a sort of a, an offsetting move by the by the government. You know, they're still kind of responding to each other, but, you know, at least in different directions. Annabelle, at question time today, Scott Morrison didn't ask a question, which is unusual, because he's been hammering the government in, in the last uh, nine months. Yeah. Was that a tactical issue to protect him, to stop him getting up to the dispatch box? Well, I think that Scott Morrison is a reasonably divisive figure in terms of the coalition at the moment. So you've got that awkward situation where... Um, where I mean, if he got up to his feet, he'd be kind of shellacked by the government, for sure, but I think there would be some people on his own side that have some hostilities going. I mean, like, welcome to the world of the wedge. I mean, I, I, I kind of... Ten years ago, we were watching the Labor Party tear itself apart over this very issue, and now we're seeing some quite strong kind of fault lines opening up in the coalition on this issue. Well, one of the front benches who dominated question time today was Bill Shorten. <laughs> Lately, the assistant treasurer has been touted somewhat mischievously by members of the coalition as a future Labor leader. And this afternoon, he was asked a question by Liberal Joanna Gash about the government's policy on climate change and pricing carbon, but he didn't exactly give a direct response. I think it's also reasonable to say that this government is very committed to certainty, unlike the opposition. We can't even get certainty on who's running the opposition. Answer to the question. We have the poodle. No order. prizes for we guessing who that is. Order the we have minister. the million dollar man. Oops, sir. The up assistant, free app. Up free app. And I won't even go to who the rat is in the opposition. The minister will return take... to the question. Order. Mm. Mm. order. You'd need a big bit of cheese in front of some of these front benches. Order. The real problem with fighting climate change is that the opposition is too busy fighting each other to do anything on climate change. Annabelle, how did Bill Shorten handle this newfound scrutiny in question time? I think he had a lovely, lovely day. <laughs> I've just never seen anyone more pleased to be the acting treasurer. Um, that made a pretty fair fist of it. You know, he was, um, he was certainly not shy. And um, in what might otherwise in politics rate as a sort of a dangerous rhetorical question, he asked the opposition about the uh, leadership wannabes on their side. Now, um, I think that the deafening response probably means that... Uh, 
I wasn't the only person thinking, hmm, there's a bit of that going on in the government too. But, uh, yeah, it was all pretty good-natured. But, um, look, he is a person who was um, promoted mm. to a ministry after the election. He is someone who, in all likelihood, will be in Cabinet before too long. Um, this was a, a big outing for him, the Wayne Swans away, so he was being the acting treasurer and he certainly took every opportunity um, that was available to him, not necessarily to um, do too much spelling out of the government, government's position on a carbon price, because it's something they're still furiously trying to negotiate behind the scenes, but certainly he took... Um he, he's trying to occupy that space that I think for the government has been vacant for a while, which is, you know, a person who can carry the attack in question time. Uh, Chris, do you reckon the opposition might throw a few more questions uh, Bill Shorten's way in the future? Um, I, I think they'd be uh, well advised to stoke as much of Bill Shorten's ego as they possibly can. Oh, he doesn't um, need that I much help, though, Chris, <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. I, I, like, I, I did really like his statement that, um, that he couldn't even be certain who the leader of the opposition was or uh, when you know that Bill Shorten is pretty sure who the Prime Minister is and will be in the future. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, considering Bill Shorten's potential leadership ambition, his importance in the... Um, his importance in the Julia Gillard network and support base, I think the opposition will love to throw him as much as possible. Is that likely to happen then, Miriam, do you think? Well, I'd like to see it, if only to see a little bit more masterful, prop-assisted question avoidance. Yes. <laughs> yes, no, that prop looked like it had been sitting there waiting to be used for a long, long time. Well, another key player in the question time was the opposition leader of business, Christopher Pine. He spent much of the afternoon in the naughty corner, being admonished by Speaker Harry Jenkins, mostly for his constant interjections about the Prime Minister. I've noted the behaviour. And in particular, I've noted an expression that I just informed the member for Sturt has been open to other interpretations by people that have contacted me from outside. And the interpretation of the expression that's being used, which I don't think is the intention of the member for Sturt, has brought the House into a bit of a less repute. But I have been charitable in saying that there is no intention of the uh, member for Sturt to have any other connotation to his expression. It would just help if he could be silent for at least 45 seconds. Annabelle, does this mean that Christopher Pine's favourite term, slag and bag, is now considered unparliamentary? Look. You need a machete to hack your way through the verbiage of the speaker there. You know, he often takes quite a simple concept and expands it to two or three impenetrable minutes. But um, I think that the expression that he was talking about there was one of Christopher Pine's favourite ones, slag and bag. He says this, mm. this is a government, you know, that uses a slag and bag technique to deflect opposition questioning. Now, I can only assume that Harry Jenkins has just got around to Googling the terms slag and bag, <laughs> <laughs> has become aware that separately they have some rather, you know... Yeah. Well, I looked it up today meetings. in Urban Dictionary mm. and um, slag and bag is not in Urban Dictionary, but slag bag is. So oh, maybe right. someone, I don't know, Miriam, has someone been writing to him about slag bag? Do you reckon that's what's going on here? I think that there's a few Urban Dictionary phrases that could quite usefully make their way into question time. <laughs> One or two of which occasionally sort of happen over the, uh, the speaker who gets duly outraged. But I think... Um, if my recollection is correct, after that um, judicious admonition uh, from the Speaker, uh, Christopher Pine still found a way to say slag he or said bag slag. or together. Or just slag. <laughs> slag. All right, he's, yeah. he's, comprom he's moved back to his compromise position, which is slag. Right. Yeah. Or, just, or, or slag and or bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, in other political news today, Labor back down on the youth allowance was also giving uh, Christopher Pine reasons to smile. After pressure from the opposition and crossbench MPs, the government has decided to to bring forward a review of income support for country students. The House today agreed not to debate the Coalition's Youth Allowance Bill because it's unconstitutional. But the Shadow Education Minister was hailing the decision to bring forward the review as a victory for the Coalition. The Coalition is glad that uh, there's been a victory for common sense, that the, uh, the government has adopted our policy, uh, that country students will be the winners from this. And of course, uh, we couldn't have done that without the support of uh, the Senate and the cross benches in both houses. Annabelle, a win for the coalition this one? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, they had um, one passage for the bill through both houses of parliament. And what the government has done has. Uh, 
we think, mounted a sort of a back down on the substantive issue of the policy in that um, this sort of clunky distinction that it exists at the moment between people who live in rural and regional remote areas and people who are in inner regional in a regional um, areas, i.e. Um, larger towns and cities um, outside the metropolitan uh, capital cities, uh, will be brought into line. Look, this has been a, um, a rather difficult and problem-plagued reform. Um, the government